Hey, what's up guys, Paulo Munoz here. Welcome back to another tutorial. Today I'm gonna to show you a breakdown of how I created one of my recent projects for my Lost Creatures series. So let's go ahead and jump straight into it. So here's the final image rendered in Blender Eve uh, with a bit of compositing in Photoshop, of course, uh, that's kind of like what I like to do. Now, to give you a bit of context, the Lost Creature series is something that I started a long time ago, and I've done a lot of different renders and illustrations on the same idea. Basically, yeah, a hairy creature with horns uh, of some sort and wandering around in the wild. <laughs> that's basically the, the concept, kind of like a combination between Bigfoot and the Yeti or something like that. So for this new addition to the Lost Creature collection, I wanted a more cinematic shot. And to be honest, I used this project to test a few things in Blender. So here's my disclaimer. I'm not a Blender expert, so there are probably better and more efficient ways to do what I did for this project. But I will show you what I did anyway, because it worked for me. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so for a project like this, I usually start with a series of thumbnails, uh, just black and white sketches to get the creative juices flowing. But because I already had a pretty good idea of what I wanted to create, I decided to just jump straight into Procreate uh, in the iPad Pro and just try to capture the mood and the general composition of the concept. I usually work on a different illustration or a different idea before I decided to go with this one. And that's the one that I shared in a time-lapse version in a previous video, so I'll link to it in case you wanna see the, the entire thing. But in terms of the 2D sketching, there's not much I can add. I just started blocking the colors and values with you know large brushes and then using the blending tool in Procreate to integrate the strokes uh, a little bit more and, and that's pretty much it. All right, so once I had a good sketch and a set of reference for the look and feel of the image, I started to work on the creature itself because obviously that's kind of like the focal point of the entire uh, render, the entire illustration. And since the creature has kind of like humanoid proportions, I decided to save some time and use Character Creator 3 to deform the base mesh. I opened Pure Ref and added my 2D sketch or my 2D illustration and placed it on top of the Character Creator window. And that is just so that I can have it permanently there as a reference as I modify the base, right? Now, Character Creator 3 is awesome to set up human characters. You can enable the morph switch on the top right corner and manipulate the base directly from the viewport. My preference for this workflow is to push and pull the base mesh from the viewport itself, so it's more intuitive for me, and then use the sliders to fine tune the changes. What's great about this process is that you can hover over any area of the mesh and the software will highlight that region that you can affect and then you can just basically click and drag uh, up and down or left to right to adjust the, the volumes of each part of the, of the human or the base mesh. The main point of difference between the generic base mesh and what I wanted to create with this character are proportions really. And I think proportions are super important when you're trying to stylize something on, or exaggerate things, right? So I focus precisely on, on that, on exaggerating the obvious features like longer than average arms, uh, large hands, bulkier forearms, short neck, wider back, and you know larger shoulders, that sort of thing. Of course, there are limits of what you can do to deform the base within Character Creator 3, or at least how much you can push things in Character Creator 3. But fortunately, and this is the best feature by far, at least for my workflow, is that you can take the base mesh and send it directly to ZBrush for further refinement. I did a whole tutorial about this workflow for the ArtStation Learning, so I'll add a link to it as well if you want a more in-depth explanation of how this works. But basically how this works is you select the meshes that you want and from the top of the window, uh, you click on the ZBrush icon and then the Go Z button uh, from the pop-up window. That's pretty much it. Once in ZBrush, I focus on tweaking the base mesh to look a lot less like a human. So for instance, the ears are of no use to me, so they're gone. I just uh, use a smooth, strong brush to flatten them against the head. The rest is just a combination of basic brushes like the move brush or the move topological brush to um, yeah, essentially pull and push the, the geometry uh, to get a, a better read of the silhouette that, that I wanted and other things like inflate to add a bit of volume and that's it really. The only thing that is worth mentioning is that if you want to use this type of workflow, you cannot edit the actual topology. In other words, you cannot add or remove vertices because the idea is to send it back to character creator. So make sure that if you follow along, you just basically move and pull things around. You can smooth, you can use the clay brush, but not, um, not actually do anything that affect the integrity of the mesh. So for the horns, I use the C-Spheres approach in ZBrush on a separate tool. And this is one of my favorite workflows in ZBrush to, to essentially set up a quick base mesh that has a rather complex shape. I like to set up the length first of whatever mesh I'm doing and then add new spheres in between the first and second one to add points um, and yeah, essentially move, rotate things around and give it a more organic shape. 
with the C-Sphere selected, you can just press Q and whatever you click within the C-Spheres, you will add a new sphere. And then you can switch to move, rotate, or uh, scale if you want to change the volume. Then from the adaptive skin palette that is under the tool palette, you can switch the dynamic resolution to zero. This is basically so that when you create the mesh or when you turn this into an adaptive skin that you can edit and sculpt, it gives you a much cleaner topology. So once I create that base mesh for the horn, it is basically rinse and repeat. <laughs> so more of the basic brushes, uh, adjusting the shape with the move brushes, refine the volume, just what I did with the character base that I brought from uh, Character Creator 3. With the base mesh of the horn ready, I copy and paste that into the character tool and I also mirror it to the other side so that I can work with, um, with symmetry. And when you bring a new piece or a new subtool, it is important to make sure that it integrates well uh, with the rest of the subtools or the rest of the mesh. So I spent a bit of time tweaking the shape of the head and a bit of the face really. Uh, not that you will see the face in the final render, but I think it's, it was a fun thing to do. But anyways, to add detail to the horn, I just divided the mesh and I manually placed some of the crevices using the damp standard brush and obviously the smoothing brush to keep everything clean as I move along in the subdivisions. Personally, this sculpting process or this stage of just uh, tweaking the volumes is something that I really enjoy. So I could spend hours here. So I'll, I'll just fast forward this a little bit more because it's more of the same. One thing that might be worth mentioning is that for some of the details here in the horn, I use some of the custom brushes from my skin creature pack just to speed up the process. Now, here's one of the coolest features that I was talking about before, uh, and that is just the connection between ZBrush and Character Creator 3. And just to reiterate, it is important to mention that I didn't modify the, the geometry of the base mesh. I just pull and push the existing geometry, but the polygon count is exactly the same thing. So once I had my tweaked base mesh, I can click and everything will be sent back to Character Creator 3, including the new meshes like the horns, which is pretty awesome. So once in Character Creator 3 again, I use this software to uh, essentially set up the pose of the character, which is a lot easier than doing it in ZBrush, since the base mesh that I'm using is already rigged and skinned um, properly. <laughs> I also parented the new geometry of the horns to the joint of the head in the base mesh rig, so that makes it a lot easier if the horns are actually following the head when you move it around. The posing is pretty straightforward. I use the Edit Pose tool in Character Creator 3, which you know gives you a very intuitive interface and you have plenty of control. And of course, the pose that I was going for is, uh, is rather simple as well. I just needed to account for that kind of like deer or that extra creature that the creature itself is dragging around. So for this, I use one of the presets that come with the software that allows you to essentially drag and drop that pose into the character. And you can choose to do it to the entire character or just poses for the hands or both hands or just one. And I think that's a pretty awesome feature that allows you to build this type of libraries uh, for your own poses. So once I was happy with the pose, I send it all back to zero. So we do the full circle here. And the main difference is that this time from the pop-up window, I selected the current pose instead of the A pose or the T pose. The rest of the process there is uh, you know, further adjusting the pose and add some of those deer legs that the creature is holding. So I knew this element wasn't going to be very visible at the end in the final image, or at least in the camera angle that I have chosen. So I took the dog project that comes with ZBrush uh, by default as a base, and then I modified the geometry a little bit. Nothing crazy, just you know, shorten the, the size of the tail and that sort of thing. And the pose is very simple as well. So I use masking brushes, transpose line, uh, the gizmo 3D to essentially twist and, and modify the body a bit and the placement of certain areas. Uh, just so that the the legs are closer to the hand of the creature, as if he's dragging this uh, this prey for <laughs> for a while. All right, so the next stage is pretty cool. Uh, to complete this entire setup of the character, I use the fiber mesh tool in ZBrush just to create the hair, and I also did a quick polypaint pass just to add some variation to the base color before I grow the the fibers. I use masking brushes to essentially define the areas where I want to grow the fibers. Then from the fiber mesh palette in ZBrush, you can go ahead and enable preview that will um, essentially create the fibers or like a preview of them. And then you can use the modifiers to quickly adjust the look and feel of those fibers. And you can define the way that you want them to grow from that mask area. So a cool trick here is to set the base color to zero and the tip color at the bottom as well uh, to something like 0 0.1 uh, or something similar, like a very, very small uh, value here. And then what ZBrush is going to do is take a look at the polypane and it's going to grow the fibers with a bit of color uh, or you know taking the color from the underlying surface that's the reason I did a quick polypaint pass uh, for the base just to variate a little bit of the actual color in the fibers 
my intention was to simulate some thick hair and potentially wet clumps. So the fibers that I set up are actually quite thick. So you can do that with the coverage slider, for example. Now clicking on the accept button in the fiber mesh palette will actually convert those fibers into a, into a new subtool. So something that you can actually manipulate and start grooming basically. So yeah, with the fiber mesh selected, I like to go to the preview settings in the same palette and enable fast preview and reduce the previous value. And this is just purely to simplify the fibers that you can see. Now for the next stage, which is grooming the fibers, uh, you can totally do what I'm going to show you using the standard grooming brushes that come with ZBrush. But I'm going to use a custom set of brushes for fiber mesh that I created just to speed up the workflow. Uh, I will put a link as well to this pack if you want to get it. But again, you can do the same thing with the default brushes in ZBrush. I like to treat the grooming process in ZBrush like I would any other type of sculpting workflow. I work on the blocking first and then try to establish kind of like the general flow of the hair, um, you know, accentuating major clumps of hair if I can or if I have them in the idea <laughs> or in the concept. I have different brushes for specific purposes. So one of them is the subtle turbulence that basically helps me to keep a more natural feel to the fibers um, so that, you know, they're not completely flat or straight after I move them with other um, grooming brushes. After the initial blocking, I use another brush to do a bit of manual refinement of the clumps and, you know, make the silhouette of the hair a bit more interesting. And the reason I left the hands without hair is so that I can create a separate set of fibers and, you know, that way I can play around with a more gradual transition between the longer hairs of the forearms and the shorter hairs that should be part of the hand. And finally, to complete the setup of the Lost Creature character, I selected the base mesh of the dog, added a few um, fibers with a brown color, and just to, you know, add, to add a little bit of contrast, I suppose, with the creature so that it's not the same color, and then did a quick grooming pass, and that's pretty much it. All right, so moving on into the scene setup, and believe it or not, this part doesn't take that long, and I only use a couple of assets that can be duplicated and tweaked slightly to add complexity to the scene. First, let's go ahead and take a look at the ground. And the idea here was to create some kind of like muddy river or a swamp. So in Blender, I created a simple plane. I scaled that and subdivided it a few times. Then I duplicated the same plane. I moved it slightly to the top. I also added a HDR image and plugged it into the environment so that I can get some nice reflections going. And the idea is that the plane on top will have the reflective material, kind of like emulating the wet areas or, or water, and the one at the bottom will be the mud or the soil material. Then I selected the plane below, went into edit mode and enabled proportional editing, and I started moving some points to uh, kind of like establish the layout of the scene, so where whatever the, the wet areas were going to be. You can probably have a more procedural, fancier way to do this with shaders and masks. Um, but this is a pretty simple thing to do and it makes sense for what I was doing, so I just went with this. Now, the trees are probably the easiest thing to make. In Blender, I enabled the sapling tree gen uh, from the add-on section in the preferences. And once this is done, you can create a tree from the add object, curve, and then select the sapling gen tree. This is an awesome little plugin that allows you to play around with a bunch of shapes. You can even choose a custom shape and play around with the values to variate the volume of the tree. I kept it pretty simple and went for one of the presets that you can select from the bottom dropdown. So after selecting the, the right base mesh that makes sense for this type of illustration uh, from the tree presets, you can go to the branch radius from the main dropdown and just further tweak the look and the density of the tree and the branches. You can even go deeper and from the branch splitting section, you can add additional branches to the base. Now for these trees, the leaves is what creates the illusion of complexity, I suppose. So from the main dropdown, you can select the leaf section and that basically populates the branches with some geometry. So I changed the hexagonal type uh, for a rectangular type and adjusted the size of the square and the number of leaves growing from the branches. Now, this is what makes this really simple workflow look really, really cool. The trunk and the branches are actually separate from the leaves, so you can assign a simple bark material to the tree and the branches, and the planes of the leaves already come with UVs. So I have a material already set up for you, and it consists of an opacity map to get the transparency, a normal map to get the details of the leaves, a roughness map, and the albedo or base color. The cool thing about the material that I have set up is that it has multiple leaves within the same image, and because the rectangular pieces of the leaves in the tree already have UVs, I can simply go into edit mode, take all the UVs or all the squares, <laughs> and basically move that around and place them on different leaves. And that way I can just get whatever type of leaf I want. And you might be thinking, well, this is really cool and it looks really simple, but it's only because you already have the cool material. I know, don't worry, I'm not gonna let you hang in here. The, the material is another extremely simple thing to do. So here we go. 
So to produce the material, I use Adobe 3D Sampler to create what's called an atlas. So here is a Adobe 3D Sampler, and if you want to know more about this workflow, I'll link to an intro series that I did about the Adobe 3D tools that you might find useful as well. So what I have to start with is just a simple square image with white background uh, where I can place a bunch of high-res photos of different leaves. That's all, right? So you can literally go ahead and take some photos of some leaf and photograph them on a white paper and do the same thing. Anyway, the process is very simple. I took that image with all the leaves and drag and dropped it into Adobe 3D Sampler. So this software is amazing. It takes care of the rest and it basically creates a bunch of texture maps that you need to recreate a convincing PBR material. The next thing I did was to bring a filter called the Atlas Creator. So you can just search for, for that. And this thing is amazing. It automatically detects the objects that you have placed on a plain background. And this is the layer that creates the nice opacity map for the leaves. To complete the effect and the look of the material, I brought in another layer called the Atlas Splitter. And this is another crazy thing from this software. It takes the leaves in this case and split them into a grid so that you can now adjust them individually or keep them in a nice grid, which is what I did for my material. And that's it. You can go ahead and export the texture map as JPEGs or a PNG images or even as an SBSAR, which is the format for a substance material. And there is an official Adobe plugin that allows you to read these files directly from Blender. All right, so let's go back in Blender. And I also use some of the sculpting tools in Blender to, to basically add some further bumps and details to the plane of the soil material. I also brought in a couple of assets from Megascans, which are fantastic. Uh, not a crazy high resolution or anything as they were going to be just uh, another asset in the distance. So you won't see a lot of the details either. Now to create the forest, I literally took that single tree that I just showed you before, duplicated it a few times, rotating it, scaling it just to uh, generate some variations, but it's literally the same tree. I also realized that I needed more elements in the background to add density to that forest, but I didn't want to duplicate all the trees again and have that extra geometry. So I kept it again super simple and I brought two photos with similar pine trees with transparency and I added them to a couple of planes in the background. The next thing is to set up the lighting and place the camera. I really like this type of workflow in Blender Eve because it allows me to see the lighting in real time. And whenever I move the, the light, I can immediately see what it's doing. But again, I kept it very simple at the beginning so that there's only one source of light, uh, which is the sun, or in this case, that is kind of like at night, the, the reflection of the sun in the moon. Now, the quote unquote fancy atmospheric effect is what makes this whole concept look the way it does. And it's just a volumetric scatter node plugged into the world. So from the world tab, I just added that and tweaked the density and the anisotropy value um, and the color a little bit as well. Now I can go ahead and take my main light and start playing around with, you know, rotation and get that very nice and dramatic lighting coming from the back uh, and just makes the whole thing look a little bit more mysterious and creepy, which is <laughs> what I was going for. All right, so we have the general layout of the scene and we have the character in ZBrush as well. We have a little bit of the lighting, so we're pretty much ready to put everything together. So for the final setup, I exported the creature from ZBrush as an FBX and imported it into Blender. Now, one of the questions that I get a lot is how to move fiber mesh out of ZBrush. And to be honest, it is like any other mesh really. So the fiber mesh is ultimately an optimized mesh in ZBrush that just looks like hair, but when you export it outside of ZBrush, it's just another mesh that you can, you know, subdivide if you want, add a cool material to it, and, and that's it. So the simplest way to move that into Blender is just exporting as an FBX from ZBrush. After establishing the camera angle and framing of the shot, I thought I needed some extra elements. So, so I just added a foreground tree towards the left of the shot and a bunch of weeds and plants scattered around the ground. The weeds that you can see here are actual geometry, not like the tree leaves because obviously they are closer to the camera. And I used the particle system in Blender and essentially scattered them around the plane. In other words, this is a more automated way to do what I did with the trees, which is duplicating and placing them manually. So if you have a pretty powerful computer, you can just go ahead and create an entire forest using the same technique, just uh, taking the tree and creating a particle system with that tree and scattered that around. Now, on top of the primary light, um, which is not very strong, actually, I added a few spotlights. And the good thing about using spotlights in a scene like this is that you have control of the size of the cone and you can highlight specific areas of the scene to add contrast or emphasis in the composition. So I end up with three spotlights that are pointing to different areas of the composition and a point light that is over the character towards the right hand side, just to exaggerate some of the highlights of the hair. Now to wrap up the rendering setup, and this is kind of like a cherry on top, I created a cube that is encompassing the entire scene and I created a material for this cube itself. So the material of this cube is just a slightly more complex version of the volume scatter I already have in the world. 
And this is the material that gives the render that sort of swirly things that mimic some kind of like 3D fog, basically. And as I said at the beginning of the video, there might be a bunch of other ways of doing this, but I like to, you know, keep things simple. And when they make sense to me, I just go with that. And for the purpose of this concept, this is what uh, gave me plenty of control as well. So what this is really is just a volume scatter. That's one of the shaders mixed with a transparent shader. The trick is how the transparency is mixed with that volumetric scatter node. So I combine a Voronoi texture and a gradient map with color ramps in between so that I can control the contrast. And like I said, this gives me a lot of control and it's a, a really nice non-destructive way of working. And you can adjust not only the scale of the texture, but the intensity, uh, you can adjust the density, the placement, um, the rotation of the entire 3D texture in that cube. And the best part is that even though this is a fake way to create this kind of like fog. I'm using a 3D texture, so it feels more realistic because it has depth and you can sort of like move the camera around and all those the foggy bits, they, they actually have depth. And to wrap up this whole project, I set up the render in Blender if, and the render is basically a screenshot of what I've been showing you in real time. The difference is, and this is another great tool in Blender, is that you can render different passes from Blender if. So I took advantage of that and additionally to the beauty pass, I exported the depth pass, the diffuse light, the volume light, which basically gives you control over the fog separately, and the main beauty passes as well as the shadow pass and the ambient occlusion. So that's basically the rendering of this project. I wanted to push uh, what I could achieve with a real-time engine like uh, Blender If. Uh, but then I brought all these passes into Photoshop for further refinement and added a few layers uh, with extra details, like the particles that you see floating in the air, probably towards the right-hand side of the image. I also added some extra painted fog just to darken up the bottom right corner. Uh, and this is just to help me frame the shot a little bit better. Then a few layers with color correction with different um, custom loots or lookup tables that I have and a couple of extra layers to add contrast and yeah, just unify the entire image. So that's it for today's video. Hopefully the tips and tricks that I have shared with you in this tutorial are of help uh, or at least inspire you to try new things. That's ultimately what I wanted to do with this project. Just try new different things, combine different tools and come up with new workflows. So please let me know what you think about this project and this video in the comments below. And if you want to see more of this type of content in the channel, I'll see you next time. Cheers.